Hi, this is Lance Martin. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Langchain. And I wanted to give kind of an overview of how I've been using multimodal LLMs uh, for a few applications. Um, first, maybe an overview of progress in multimodal LLMs. Um, back in 2012, Andre Karpathy put this kind of entertaining blog post out talking about the state of computer vision. And the, the point was that computer vision models were pretty far away from actually reasoning about an image like this and kind of understanding why it's funny. Um, it was kind of notable that like, this was a real challenge for vision models and we were really far away from kind of AI or visual recognition that can kind of understand and appreciate humor. Now today, if you take that image and pass it to GPT-4 V, it indeed is able to understand exactly why, you know, this is funny. And, and it's actually kind of a fun demonstration to do that just to get a sense for how good these kind of visual recognition capabilities have gotten with recent multimodal LLMs. You know, another interesting example of this is Steve Wozniak had in 2010, the coffee test, you know, what would it take for uh, a, a test for AGI would be that a, that a computer could actually make a cup of coffee, could move, you know, enter a room, determine all the elements necessary to make a cup of coffee and make a cup of coffee. In the GPT-4V paper, they actually showed a number of interesting examples of visual recognition where, you know, the model can recognize, you know, elements in a coffee machine, how to operate a coffee machine, how to get around a kitchen, parts of a kitchen. And so, you know, it's another interesting demonstration that within, you know, roughly 10 to 15 year time span, we've really gone quite far in terms of kind of visual recognition capabilities. And now these are really in kind of everyone's hands with GPT-4V and some other models that we'll talk about today. Um, so kind of a quick overview of models. A lot of this work, of course, you know, predates, uh, you know, the current year of 2023. Uh, it's probably worth noting CLIP. It's very important work from OpenAI um, that kind of map data from different modalities, text and images <clears throat> into a shared embedding space. Um, it's open source and actually CLIP embeddings are still used uh, for visual encoding in models that you'll see today, for example, Lava, um, and can also be used as kind of multimodal embeddings to take text or images and map them to a common embedding space. Uh, so CLIP is like a very important um, kind of work in this, in this like arc of multimodal uh, LLMs. Um, Lava came out earlier this year and it's a really interesting open source model that builds on clip, uh, that uses, um, a clip image encoder as noted with 30, 336 by 336 pixel resolution and an LLM Vicuna, which you may have heard of. It's a fine tuned variant on Llama 2. Um, variants have been adapted for other LLMs like Mistral 7B. So this is actually really cool. We'll show this a little bit later, but it is open source. You can run your laptop um, and it gives you really interesting multimodal capabilities. Uh, Fuyu is another one that came out this year, uh, which actually has an interesting architecture, bypasses the image encoder, can run at variable resolution. That's from Adept. Um, and of course, GPT-4V and most recently Gemini from Google have come out. These are state-of-the-art, closed source multimodal LMs, very strong performance, very, very good, impressive demos. Um, available through APIs. So that's kind of the landscape and there's indeed more models this is just kind of a, a short overview with some links as well. Um, and, and maybe it's worth walking through what's kind of going on. So with Lava, for example, um, there's a notion of image embedding. So we're kind of familiar with text embeddings are used very commonly in, in a lot of AI work today, taking a piece of text and mapping it into an embedding space, which is just kind of like a high dimensional vector representation of a piece of text, a chunk of text. You can do the same thing for images. You can take an image and map it to this kind of this this uh, you know higher dimension uh, embedding space, and similar images kind of wound can wind up in similar uh, space in this in this projection. This is kind of like a a two D representation of uh, kind of the embedding, and you can see that you know similar visually similar objects kind of are mapped to similar regions in this high dimensional space. In this case, it's kind of projected onto two D. Um, so that's kind of step one. You can take images, you can embed them. And then step two is you actually can do this projection step. You can take kind of a, a, an image embedding and project it into the same kind of space as text embeddings. And so um, this is kind of this, this very nice kind of visualization showing you have your image encoder like clip, you get your, your multimodal embedding or your image encoding, and then you project that 
uh, into kind of the, the same the same kind of token space as your language embedding, and then those tokens can be concatenated and passed to the LLM. So you can really think about this as like kind of two steps. You're like basically taking visual content, embedding it, then projecting it into a space that can be concatenated with your text tokens. And that's really all you're doing. So when you take a multimodal LLM, you're giving it like a piece of text, an image, and you're kind of mapping those both to kind of a common token space. And it can read that kind of common uh, concatenated string of tokens um, at once and reason about what's going on. So, so that's maybe like a simple like mental model of how to think about what's happening when you work with multimodal LLMs. Um, yeah, let's talk a little about use cases. So Greg Cameron on Twitter kind of had this kind of nice visualization of a bunch of things that have been then shown with GPT 4V. Um, a lot of people have seen really cool demos with image captioning. Um, extraction's a really good one, taking an image, extracting elements, text elements, nothing on and so forth. Um recommendations. So there's kind of like a lot of design applications, um, kind of suggestions about how to improve the visual aesthetics of a scene of a, of a, uh, of like, you know, um, of an object. Um, and of course, like interpretation, this is like, you know, common in the rag context. For example, if you have like a, you know, collection of say, we'll talk a little bit later today, a little bit later about slides, um, or about diagrams in documents, you can, of course, use a, a vision model to reason about what's happening there in a question and answer context. Um, and this was like an interesting demonstration of, of extraction uh, shown in the in the GPD four uh, V paper uh, here. Uh, th actually, this is a follow on to the GPD four V model by Microsoft, showing here's some interesting um, explorations, and they, they talked about kind of extraction from complex documents. Um, so let's actually walk through a demo to make this a little bit more concrete, and I'll share kind of a bunch of code and, and templates that can be easily reused later. Um, so I think you know presentations like slide decks are a really good application for vision models because they're inherently kind of visual. They have lots of kind of complex visual elements like like graphs, uh, tables, figures, and they're very common. You know, every nearly every organization uses slides in some capacity and. Conventional RAG approaches that just strip the text out really miss a lot of this. So let's try kind of how could we build a RAG system over the visual content in, in a slide deck. Um, so to start off, what I did was I took a slide deck, and this is um, uh, Datadog's Q3 earnings report. I randomly chose it. You know, it, it was just like an interesting demonstration of like kind of complex, uh, you know, financial information and, and figures in the slide deck. And I create a set of 10 questions and answer pairs about these slides. So this is like my eval set. Um, and this is really easy to do. I can just create a CSV that has like my question and my answer, in this case, like my input output pairs. Um, and it's just a set of questions that I've devised myself. I looked at the slides. I said, okay, here's some interesting question answer pairs. I put them in a CSV and I load these into Langsmith. Now Langsmith is LangChain's platform uh, that supports variability and evaluations. Um, and I create a data set for myself in Langsmith. And there's some links down here that show exactly how to do that. But that's my starting point. So I say, okay, here's my evaluation set. I have the slide deck. I built 10 question answer pairs from the slides. Now let's compare some approaches. There might be two different ways to think about multimodal RAG. Um, so one is this notion of multimodal embeddings. So we take our slides, we extract them as images. In every image, we use multimodal embeddings to map them into this kind of this embedding space that is common between kind of text and, and images. Um, for that, I use open clip embeddings. Um, and so I now have a, an index. In this case, I use Chroma that contains a bunch of images uh, that have been embedded using open clip. Um, at retrieval time, I ask a question. I use, I basically take the, the natural language question, embed it indeed with multimodal embeddings, same ones, similarity search, just like normal, retrieve images that are similar to my question, pass the image to, in this case, uh, my multimodal LM, like GPT-4V, to answer the question. So I'm just doing really image retrieval from natural language using multimodal embeddings. That That's process, that's kind of step one at the top. Now, Option two is a little bit different where I take every image and I caption it. So I basically produce a summary of the image and I embed that summary with text embeddings. And 
We'll talk a little bit later why this might have advantages, but for now, let's just say these are the two approaches. So I do this captioning. So I take the image, convert it to text, um, embed that text. And then I have this linkage between this, like this summary or caption and the raw image. I search, given my question, among those summaries. So I'm just doing a kind of text embedding lookup. And then I fish out whatever image is closest and pass that to the uh, to the multimodal on for synthesis. So in short, in one case, I'm just using multimodal embeddings to do the lookup across my images. In the other case, I'm using text embeddings on image summaries. So that's really kind of the, the two approaches. Now, first we can do like a semi check. We can take our slide deck, we can embed it, and then we can show, does this even work at all? So here I ask a question, what's the projected TAM over time for observability? And I see that this is my retriever I've built and the notebook is all linked here. Um, I can retrieve the slide image that's relevant to that question. So that's pretty neat, right? I can ask a natural language question and get back an image. Then I can take that image, pass it to GPT-4V. 4V answers the question very precisely by looking at the details in the image. So that's the general flow here. Um, for evaluations, then all I'm going to do is I take whatever rag chain, whether it's my uh, image capturing model or my multiple modal embedding model. Uh, and for every, for every question, I generate the rag answer, uh, compare that to my ground truth answer. I have this grader. So Langsmith will do all this for me. It will run a grader that will use, for example, a specified LLM like GPT-4 to compare those two responses, uh, to compare like the, basically the, the rag answer to the ground truth answer. And, um, and then I can, yeah, I'll show a little bit later, kind of do this nice comparison, uh, between different models for each question and which one's doing better and then root cause. So that, that's kind of set up here. Again, I, I build an eval set based on the slide deck. I have two different rag approaches and I have my evaluation approach right here, and we can look at the results. So if I use GPT-4 text only, just like with standard PDF loader, take the slide deck, rip out the text, do it, it's pretty bad. You might expect, I mean, of course it's kind of and to be expected because a lot of the questions rely on visual content, diagrams and so forth, which you can't get if you just look at the text. Now, with OpenClip, here's where it's a little bit interesting. With multimodal embeddings using OpenClip, the performance is moderate. And you can see I'm using OpenClip with GPT-4V. So really what's, what's happening here is the retrieval step is a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, of moderate quality. And we can talk a little bit why this is, but the intuition is that for slides that are pretty similar, multimodal embeddings may not quite have the the capacity to differentiate them. And I'd made this as a controversial statement. It's also complicated by OpenClip has many different embedding models available. So I chose one that has kind of reasonable memory footprint and uh, in like in like solid performance, not exceptional performance. So again, there's a lot you can play with here. There's many different multimodal embedding models, but I think the thing I'll caution is that retrieval may be challenging using multimodal embeddings in a setting like slides that are actually pretty like semantically similar. What you really want is subtle differentiation between like the content in the slide. Like is this table showing A or table showing B, but maybe to the multimodal embedding model, they both kind of look like tables. There isn't that much differentiation in retrieval. So I think that's just a caveat. What I see is the multi-vector, um, which is basically the image captioning approach is really good. And you kind of would expect this. If you, if you take gpt 4 b and ask it to summarize an image uh, of like a, of a table or graph, it does really good. Like it's, you can get really rich summaries and then you're searching in natural language and I'll show some examples later, um, but you can do really effective retrieval based on an image caption that's generated by a good model like GPT-4V. Um, and performance here is very strong. Um, again, you know, uh, the error bar shows standard error across, um, it's a 10 eval set in three trials. And so there's a little bit of noise I'll talk a little bit later. There's also some kind of API flakiness with GPT-4V that, that I think will hopefully be resolved soon. Um, but so I just want to, the, the intuition here is that for visual content like slide decks, just using text naturally, as you expect, is, is really insufficient for like answering, you know, interesting questions. Multimodal embeddings have a lot of promise. They probably are the most promising in terms of like ultimate ceiling, um, there's lots of models that are coming out that will come out soon. Um, and 
you know, it has architectural appeal. It's fairly simple. It's just like in different embedding model, you stick that into a vector store and, and it, it's pretty seamless. The captioning thing actually has really good performance. Now, architecture is a little bit more complicated. You have to generate these image captions ahead of time. There's some cost concerns there. Um, so I think that's kind of the trade-offs. Today, the captioning approach can really be effective for things like, you know, complex content like slides, uh, but it's a little bit more costly. Um, and this is kind of showing how you can use Langsmith to like deep dive and compare. So this is, I can look at all my question answer pairs here and it, this will show the answer generations. Um, and I can dig into each one. Um, you can see like the, the greater scores. So zero being incorrect, one being correct. Um, and then my experiments across the top. So I mean, this is just showing like kind of an overview of what you get. If you run this evaluation with Langsmith, you can look at these, these evaluate, you can look at the results kind of in, in, high granularity, which is quite convenient. Um, now here, here's kind of a fun case study. Um, so the question was Datadog, um, well, the question was how many how many customers Datadog have? The answer was around 26,800, and that was from one slide. You can see here, that looks like this. And the answer is embedded in this kind of table type thing. And the visual model has to find this slide and then actually reason about it and get the right answer out. So you can see that text only misses this, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, multimodal embeddings likely retrieves the incorrect slide. Um, and indeed, the multi-vector approach, which is our image captioning, does get this correct. And right down here, you're seeing this is a an image of the Langsmith trace that you get. So Langsmith actually renders the images for you. So you actually can look at, and I may be able to even open this up now. Maybe we can, we can look at it. Um, yeah, actually here it is. So this is actually looking at the trace. Um, and what you can see is this is what was actually past the LM. So here's the images that got retrieved. Here's the prompt. You're an analyst has to answer questions. Um, here is the user for a question, how many total customers does Datadog have? And then the tables or text and pretty cool. It's able to find this in the images and gives you your answer. So that's like a nice demonstration of like, these are actually really cool and impressive models. Um, and, um, uh, just make sure I, yeah, I'm back on the slides. Very good. Um, and that, that's kind of a nice demonstration of how well the, these models can work. Uh, same here, just looking at like retrieval from a table. Again, uh, actually in this case, they all got it right. So that, that's kind of interesting. Top K rag was able to really get this. So in some cases, indeed, text only is sufficient. It can strip this, this text out. It can reason about this table good enough. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth noting that depends on the nature of the questions you want to, you want to answer, to want to ask about your content. Uh, but in many cases, um, as noted in the eval results, imagery is very, very important to capture. And it could also be the orientation of the text within the image kind of matters, especially reasoning about their content as well, which you would lose with you if you just do kind of a, a extraction of the text alone. But in this case, it's a table. So, you know, visual reasoning works really well, but hey, so does just stripping the text, stripping the text from the table, fr from the slide as well. Um, so maybe here's like an, another way to look at all this is we talked a lot about different like RAG architectures. Now we can look across different LLMs and this is on the same eval set. And now we're looking at again, uh, text only. So results kind of consistent. This is actually a separate set of experiments done by one of my colleagues. Um, similar results though. So you can see text only pretty bad around 20%, uh, some st the standard error is shown. Uh, I guess this is across 10 different trials. Um, now, what you see here is we're now comparing Gemini Pro to GPT-4V. And what you can see is you, there's the same architectural trend, which is that open clip embeddings, at least ones we're using, fall short of the captioning approach uh, pretty consistently. Um, and the, indeed, the multi-vector approach with image summaries does the best. And also, uh, Gemini, which you can see kind of noted here, is on par with GPT-4V, which, you know, their paper also reports this, um, you know, the precise quantitative difference between the models 
can be kind of difficult to assess. Of course, a lot was reported. The intuition, though, is like it's a very good model, and it, it, it seems to be on par with GPT four V. Absolutely worth testing and trying. Uh, so I, I, you know, we've been pretty impressed with it. Um, it's very good to have multiple options for multimodal for multimodal models. So I think that that's you know really nice thing to highlight. I'll show another interesting thing here. I was looking at resolutions. So there's this kind of odd thing with multimodal models that you have to pass images into them. And like, well, you know, what resolution should you provide those images? And it, it's a little bit kind of vague. So I did kind of a titration across different resolutions. And this is on that same eval set. Um, here I'm showing the mean fraction correct, uh, show standard errors. I ran three runs on this 10 question eval set. Um, I ran on GPT-4 V and Gemini and you can see kind of, it, it's a little bit noisy and I'll show you kind of why in the next slide it's a little bit noisy here. The general trend is notable at very low resolutions as 192 by 108 pixels. Performance is really bad. So kind of on the extreme, it's really bad. And performance is indeed the best kind of in this, in this larger resolution range. There is kind of noise here in the middle. So I still don't have a totally firm view of where the precise cutoff is with respect to like uh, performance degradation. With both models, it seems you can kind of elite all the way down to 40 by, by uh, 270. Performance is still moderate. It's kind of consistent in across this mid-range and then you get above 800 into 900 pixels um, and the deep performance goes up. The results are a little bit noisy. I'd like to do more studies here. At least this is just showing you kind of the intuition is indeed that image resolution does matter. Intuitively, lower resolution is worse, which is what we observe. Um, and it seems to be the case that, you know, larger, um, you really, I, I guess you could argue this result may be a bit of an outlier. I'm, I think I'll, I'll show you why on the next slide. Um, but indeed, high resolution does better. So it's just something to be aware of. You should test it for yourself. Uh, but image resolution does have an effect on performance, as, as you may expect. Now, this is kind of an odd result. And actually, I hope it's kind of a temporary issue that's resolved. And maybe it's data by the time this video comes out. I have noticed that GPT-4V does have some kind of odd reliability issues. You get 400 errors. I linked the ticket above. I hope it's resolved soon. But I saw this quite a bit in my recent, on my recent runs. Uh, it did not seem correlated to resolution. It seems uh, more or less random. Uh, I think it's also skewed the prior results a bit because the scoring, um, the correct scoring um, may have been affected by uh, a number of the trials for uh, uh, basically erroring out and failing to produce a correct or incorrect score. So it, it injected some noise in the prior result, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, this is just a caveat. If you're thinking about using this in production, I, I hope it's fixed soon. You know, I've reached out to OpenAI about this. And, and so, you know, that's just something, just something to flag. And maybe, again, this is a kind of temporary issue and maybe it's a moot by the time this video comes out. I'd love for that to be the case. I just wanted to flag it. Um, another thing I did, uh, kind of related task, is I took just this one slide and I tried kind of a small extraction challenge. I asked eight questions about this slide and I tested a, a number of different LLMs. Um, and to see kind of how well it can extract information from this one slide at variable resolutions, you can see the results kind of match what we showed before, although there's one interesting addition here you'll note. First, resolution matters. So, of course, low resolution, obviously quite bad. Performance, very, very good. So it gets, you know, all of them correct at 672 and above for both Gemini and GPT-4V. Again, differences between Gemini and GPT-4V, you know, not really notable. Um, both really good models. Now, I also looked at um, Lava 13B because I'm really optimistic about using Lava 13B for things like image captioning because it's an expensive task. What I did note is that it's not very good at extraction. And I went back and listened to some recent videos with the author of the, of, of the, of the paper. He mentions that a newer model with better OCR capabilities is actually coming out soon. I'm really eager to test that. Um, I just want to kind of throw a caveat out there that Lava, from what I can tell, is, is not very strong um, at kind of extraction. It kind of makes sense. As noted before, it downsamples it to, uh, you know, 336 pixels, so kind of somewhere in this range. So it's downsampling quite a bit. You can see even with these really good models, if you downsample to 336, you're kind of in this bucket, and you, you've lost a lot of performance relative to higher resolution. 
So that's issue one. And then issue two, um, I, I guess Lava just was not really trained for OCR or extraction. It, I've seen it be able to extract kind of very obvious kind of big text blobs. But if you give it a slide like this, it's really detailed, lots of kind of, you know, jumbled up content. The, the, it's possible that just the downsampling blurs this all together. You really can't resolve these like very fine scale details from the image. So that's just another caveat for extraction tasks. It doesn't seem like lava is quite there yet, but I hope that changes soon. I'm really optimistic. I really want to use it for captioning because um, that would save a lot of cost. And, and it's a you know very good repetitive task that open source model would be really helpful for. Um, now, maybe just to round this out, like how can you get started, try these things out for yourself? Well, we've we released a bunch of different templates. Um, now here's kind of a fun one. This is like really simple, but um, you know, most people who have like, you know, iPhones or Android devices kind of have used the visual search capability. Like you can search through your food pics or your, you know, family pics or whatever it is, ask a question. You can find pictures related to that, like ice cream and find all my ice cream pictures. Like it's a nice, you know, clear functionality that a lot of people use and, and like. And what's kind of fun and cool is that with these new multimodal LMs um, that can run locally, you can like build this for yourself. Um, now I understand this is probably a bit of a demo for now. It, this is not like a production application, of course, but it's interesting. It's a really like interesting and important like starting point. It's cool that you can run this locally for yourself. And we're still very early in the, in the arc of these models developing and getting better. So this template, which you release, basically lets you take a set of images and, and embed them using OpenClip. And you can run this on your laptop. I have a, I have a MacBook uh, Pro, uh, M2, uh, 32 gig max. And um, this all works really well. Like I have a bit of a you know, more powerful laptop, but, but you know, it works on colleagues who have uh, lower power laptops. Again, using Clip to embed these images, store them in Chroma locally. You can ask a question um, and it will then pass, uh, retrieve the image, pass it to, in this case, uh, it's actually using Baklava, which is um, Lava plus Minstrel, um, which is pretty cool. And I use Olama to basically serve that model. And um, it can it can do, um, you know, it can serve as a visual assistant. It can answer questions about the about the, the images. And so, you know, what kind of ice cream have I tried? Oh, you know, it'll, it'll find this ice cream photo and say matcha saucer. That's kind of cool. Um, and it works with both like multimodal embeddings and captioning. So we talked about those two approaches previously, and we have templates for both. So you can try both approaches. Um, and again, here, here's actually like what it actually looks like. So when you spin up this template, it's like two or three commands just to like create your own index and then one command to like spin it up and it'll basically create, it'll, it'll basically spin up this little playground for you. And you can ask questions. You can just say, Hey, like what kind of ice cream do I have? It gives you the answer. Like it retrieves the image and, you know, the beauty of these templates is you can play with them yourself, modify the prompts, just get, puts everything together, lets you get started easily. And this is showing over here, the Langsmith trace, which actually shows the retrieval of this image of, of my matcha saucer, which I happen to like quite a bit. It's very delicious. And, uh, and it shows, um, you know, your, your, your Hubble assistant, give a description of, of food pictures, give a deal summary of the image. It gives a summary. This image is a close up of green frothy ice cream. Um, and, um, yeah, it looks like matcha. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Like it works, it runs on your laptop. It's, it's like, you know, it's a really fun demonstration. You can play with it. You can change the prompt. You can change the model. Olama makes it very easy to test different multi multimodal LMs. And these things are only going to get better. So like, it's, it's a fun thing to, to get started with. Um, and this is just like a nice way to just have everything together in one piece and to spin it up very quickly. Um, now, maybe for applications that are a little bit more like, you know, maybe like commercially relevant or, or like a little bit more complicated, um, we have two different templates that use GPT-4V or Gemini for RAG over slide decks. And this is like kind of nice to get started. So you should take a slide deck, it produces a bunch of images, you embed those with OpenClip, store them in Chroma, um, and retrieve images related to the question. And send this to either uh, you know either Gemini or GPT-4V and get answer. And this works quite well. I mean, I have to say I've been really impressed. Uh, this is using multiple embeddings. We talked about that before. A little bit limited in retrieval quality. The captioning approach, though, which I'll show here, um, you know, effectively the same except for just this, you know, just this piece, uh, really does work quite well. And so, you know, this is actually showing an example of, you know, the answer you get from this question. Um, 
So it's absolutely worth trying and testing. And this template lets you get started really easily. Um, and yeah, this is like just kind of an example showing you can retrieve the correct image um, and reason about it. And, um, you know, I, I think these templates are a very nice way to just get started quickly. Um, and they're absolutely worth trying. So that's actually all I had for slides. Um, just maybe, hopefully this is the kind of a useful summary and overview of how to get started with multimodal LMs, the different LLMs available to you, number, numerous templates that you can use to, to test. Um, and um, I hope it, I hope you find this useful. Um, thank you.